I'm just shallow and lonely and insecure. Driving is a significant responsibility, and many people do not take the task seriously enough. It is far too common to see people using their phones, chatting with other passengers, and drinking coffee while driving. But the most reckless and dangerous of all are those who drive drunk. We've seen courtroom videos where convicted drivers appear to be remorseful, apologizing for hurting others and promising to desist from such acts. Unfortunately, the deed is done and each year, drunk driving impacts thousands of individuals inflicting injuries and lasting harm to families and communities. Join us as we take a deeper look into the top 10 drunk drivers reacting to life sentences. I miss my mom and my dad. I feel sad when the accident happened. Number 10. Amber Pereira. In 2017, Amber Pereira, a Tampa Bay drunk driver, was arrested for a fiery collision on the Selman Expressway, which claimed the lives of three members of the Felipac family. According to investigators and police reports, Pereira was intoxicated while driving. Pereira was traveling in her Kia along the Selman motorway when she collided with Louise Felipac, his wife Rita, and their eight-year-old daughter Georgia, who were all in the vehicle. The force of the impact pushed the Felipac family's Hyundai across the grassy median and into the westbound lanes, where it struck two other vehicles and caught fire. According to police, after the crash, Pereira's Kia spun out in the median and was able to regain control. But instead of caring for the injured Felipacs, Pereira was too intoxicated to think clearly. She kept driving and finally stopped about two miles away, and only after her car could not move any further due to the damage. Pereira, who had been diagnosed with non-epileptic seizures before the crash, told a witness after the collision that the condition had made her lose control. Pereira's attorney, Hubble Lawson, tried to convince the court on this basis, however, the argument was dismissed as the data recorder on Pereira's car showed she was driving 120 miles per hour five seconds before the crash, then only slowed to about 100 miles per hour after, while trying to run from the situation. In her car, four empty bottles of beer were discovered, and a further investigation showed that she had a 0.10 blood alcohol level, which is in violation of Florida's traffic laws. More investigation revealed Pereira also had three drug compounds in her system, two of which were in high amounts to affect Pereira's brain. Just before handing down the sentence, Circuit Judge Christopher Sabella referred to her jail conversation with her family member where she was aired in court saying, My life is wrecked. In his words, Sabella said, Miss Pereira, you attempted to flee until your car no longer allowed you to flee. And to the degree that the seizure has been attempted to explain, you continued to avoid any responsibility for this crime at the hospital when you tried to conceal the tubes of blood that had been taken from you. Sabella said, Yes, ma'am, your life is wrecked. But you also ruined a lot of lives and ended three lives. Due to her minimal criminal history, her attorney, Lawson, talked about sentencing guidelines and called for a prison term of at least 35 years, which includes 20 years in prison and 15 years probation for his client. But Sabella announced a 50-year life sentence, which got Pereira shedding uncontrollable tears. Your life is ruined, but you also ruined a lot of lives. Number nine, Grace Coleman. A 23-year-old California woman, Grace Elizabeth Coleman, was arrested on December 8, 2020, for a drunken hit-and-run crash that claimed the life of 27-year-old Henry Eduardo Saldana Mejia, his 28-year-old wife, Gabriela Andrade, and their three young daughters. The unfortunate parents, Saldana Mejia and Andrade, lost their lives on the scene, while their three young daughters, Emma Sofia, Elena and Samantha were injured and trapped in the car as Coleman tried to walk away from the crash until she was apprehended. In this catastrophe, investigators found a blood alcohol level of 0.22 in Coleman's bloodstream, which was nearly three times the 0.08 legal driving limit in California. Also, she was guilty of driving 75 miles per hour in her Range Rover. Knowing the magnitude of her offense, Coleman then arranged a rare meeting at the courthouse where she spoke privately with the victim's family. In the meeting where her attorney, the judge, and the victim's lawyer were all absent, the victim's family said they held nothing against her because they believed she was very remorseful, but the family faulted the choices she made. Jeff Roberts, the attorney for the children, sued Coleman and her parents, James and Kelly Coleman, for alleged wrongful death and negligence. The lawyer blamed her parents for giving their daughter the car after her two bouts of drunk driving in June 2019 and August 2020. Roberts further believed the case to be just another example of a drunk driver ruining multiple lives, including her own and the people around her. 
and with the guidance of her attorney, Coleman pleaded as charged to the two murder counts. She also admitted to injuring the little girls and accepted some other misdemeanor, thinking that would change the sentencing, but it didn't. To conceal her reactions during the hearing, Coleman wore a mandatory mask all through. Yet, it was still evident that she was crying and could not stop thinking about what she had done. I miss my mom and my dad. I feel sad when the accident happened. Number 8. Olivia Carolee Culbreth. On February 2, 2014, a witness who first noticed a mischievous driver on the wrong lane called 911, warning of an impending crisis. Olivia, the wrong way driver, was reported to have been drinking in the early hours before the crash, drove into oncoming traffic on the 57 and 60 freeways at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. She was just 21 years old, and this crash occurred only 11 days after she had just become a mother. She had a similar conviction years earlier stemming from a crash in which she wrapped her car around a light pole. And the prosecutor in charge of her proceeding had warned that she could be charged with murder if she was involved in another drunk driving crash. But this time, she went overboard. She slammed her car into a Ford Explorer on the westbound freeway, taking the lives of five people. This led to the death of three members of the same family who were in the Ford. Olivia's best friend, Kristen Young, and her sister, Maya, also died in the process. Culbreth had been in custody since the crash, although she was initially hospitalized in a jail ward as a result of her injuries from the collision. On the day of her sentencing, she was brought to court on a stretcher and then eventually in a wheelchair. You must have guessed right. During the police investigation, Olivia's blood alcohol content came back high as expected. It was measured at 0.15% about three hours after the crash, which means it would have measured higher if checked after the standard one-hour count. Culbreth apologized to the victim's families shortly before being sentenced, saying in an emotional statement that she hoped those affected by the crash would have some comfort. She said, I was wrong. I was so wrong, and I take full responsibility for anything, noting that she wants to be the best mother she could for her son. Her son, now five years old, had only seen his mother in jail. The drunk driver said no matter the prison time, she will continue to punish herself for the rest of her life. Although she pleaded no contest to six counts of second degree, her attorneys believed it was a way to avoid a trial that would further traumatize the grieving families. After Olivia was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment, her attorney, Sheehan, who by the way noted that the offense itself was possibly the worst crash in the history of Southern California, described the sentence as extremely harsh. Sheehan later said Culbreth, who happened to be a nurse, now dedicates her prison terms saving lives. Yet, her new side of humanity will never justify the lives she had recklessly taken. I want everyone to know that I would die a million times over again. Any one of you, any one of you got me. Number seven, Charlesia Pelt. 27 years old, Charlesia Pelt drove through a red light at Seven Mile and Hayes in a minivan speeding in the wrong direction before smashing into another car. It was an awful moment that led to the death of her three-year-old kid called Michael Jones. Michael, who was in the back seat, was ejected during the collision, and her mother's van spun around and ran over him. Michael's father, who later got the heartbreaking news, could be heard grieving as he said, I got to the hospital to see my baby laid out with tire marks on his arms, on his face. I don't understand any of this. Pelt, who was drunk at 7 o'clock in the evening, blew somewhere between a .20 and a .24. As she was arraigned in court, she apologized to her family for the disappointment. Pelt also pleaded with the judge during her sentencing, saying, I tried everything in this world to be with my babies, to do everything right. I feel like I'm getting like I didn't. I know that was the most wrong thing ever that a parent can do. After being charged with child abuse and killing, the judge, James Chelinsky, also accused her of three counts of operating while intoxicated and having an unrestrained kid in the car. The judge further sentenced her to 15 years in prison and three to 10 years for child misconduct. Pelt, who pleaded guilty to these charges, could be seen crying and apologizing for an act that cannot be undone. A witness of the crash, Judy Carter, added to the memorial by saying that she will always remember Michael's death whenever she rides past the crash scene. Emotions continue to run high for residents who witnessed what happened. Oh, no, father, I'm sorry. Number six, Michelle Lake. 
In 2006, after involving herself in a drunk driving crash that claimed the life of a passenger, Michelle Lake was sentenced to two years in prison and also had her driver's license revoked for this conviction. Annoyingly, she did not learn from it. And on December 6, 2018, at about 9.30 a.m., the 35-years-old mother of three had a crash again that severely injured two people. This time, she was driving, crossed the center line, and hit a car driven by Jody Cox. Jody Cox was in the car with her two-year-old kid and another adult during the crash, and were just lucky to be unharmed. When Cox appeared before the courtroom during the sentence, it was evident from her words the emotional pain she had suffered. She said, I still have issues, I still have pain, I still can't walk right, I still have emotional issues, I still see that constantly, and it affects me a great deal. I still have pain, I still can't walk right, I still have emotional issues, I still see that. Lake, being apologetic, replied to Cox's statement, I'm so sorry. I'm so very sorry. I'm so sorry. A great deal. I'm so very sorry. Michelle Lake also pleaded for mercy from the court. Judge Patrick Dinkelacker, who sympathized with her, did not show any mercy, calling her a ticking time bomb, the title she duly earned by driving without a license. However, Lake was not guilty of driving without a license alone. During the investigation, it was found that drugs were in her system at the time of the crash. Lake called the contents found in her system demons, which had continued to haunt her every day, and that the demons had taken advantage of her weak state of mind the night before the accident. She recognized that her decisions will spook her, her family, and the victim's family forever. Her attorney, who stressed that Lake needs help from these addictions, recommended just 10 years of a prison sentence for her. In the end, Dinkelacker gave the maximum sentence of 10 years for one count of vehicular assault and one count of aggravated vehicular assault plus a lifetime driver's license suspension. As the judge read her sentence, Lake's knees buckled and she sobbed as she went to the ground and was immediately led from the courtroom to begin her sentence. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. In this image, we have a young woman who looks more frightening than most of the drunk drivers we have mentioned. When you check the background, it is more like a photograph taken in a courtroom. Do you recognize her? What are your thoughts about drunk drivers and the sentences that they receive? Let's hear your thoughts in the comments section below. Number 5. Chorge Solis. 22 years old, Chorge Solis from Ellenwood was already on probation for previous drunk driving allegations. Now he faced new charges when he drove his Ford F-350 north in the southbound lanes of Interstate 75, colliding head-on with a car on its way to Florida from Illinois. The accident which occurred in the early hours of Father's Day was an unpleasant sight. In this crash, three members of Benton lost their lives. They were children who happened to be with their two grandfathers on a road trip to their mother when this occurred. Michael Osborne, who was driving, was able to escape death, but his grandson, Cabrin, and her sister, Hallie, were killed, while Cabrin's brother, Clayton, was paralyzed. The children's other grandfather, Michael Furlow, also didn't make it. Kimberly Inglesby, the kid's mother, believed that justice will never be enough for the pains she had. In her statement, she said, When anybody dies because of somebody else's actions, there's no justice that will ever be served. The pain is still the same as the day that it happened. Every day that I wake up still feels the same without them here. Solace was uninjured. It was discovered he had a blood alcohol level of 0.125. To this, he pleaded guilty. He likewise pleaded guilty to six counts of first-degree homicide by a vehicle, driving under the influence of alcohol, possession of an open alcohol container, driving on the wrong side of the road and driving while license was suspended or revoked. Atlanta Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard said, Solis was so drunk that when police arrived, he was passed out while leaning on the expressway median. Because Paulus was underage at the time of this deadly wreck, the court sentenced him to 75 years in prison, where he will serve at least 50 years before being eligible for parole. Polis' reaction throughout the court session was sober that one wouldn't believe he was the arrested driver. I cannot tell you today that I am a Christian without flinching and disgust at what God has done to me. Number 4. Todd Grutzinski on September 2, 2018, Denver, a major city in the United States, witnessed a drunk driving crash that took yet another young life. But it would have been a different day if certain choices had been made before the morning of the 30th. Then the 25-year-old Angela Wimmer would have been alive to live out her life's dreams. That morning, 47 years old, Todd woke up, put on his Green Bay Packers jersey, and went out to indulge in some football and drinking. And by 12.39 p.m., Todd had left the third bar and had downed a total of 16 drinks. 
Why didn't any bartender stop him from drinking? And why did nobody call authorities knowing he was going to drive drunk? After rounds of drinking, Todd, despite his six previous convictions of driving under the influence of alcohol and numerous second chances, got into his landscaping truck, then hit the road running. On the morning of the crash, Angela had gone to church and stopped at a Sonic drive-in for lunch. She was headed to her home when she stopped at the red light and then got rear-ended. The crash launched Wimmer's Mazda into a 44 miles per hour slide and sent it into another vehicle. The crash led to the collision of three other nearby cars at Colfax Avenue. As emergency professionals tried to rescue Angela's life, Todd spun his tires in an attempt to run from the situation. Spear, who works for West Metro Fire Rescue, said, I could see him spinning his tires. The crash sent Angela to a hospital where she had brain surgery before she later passed on. Todd Grudzinski was later charged with 15 separate counts, including first-degree murder. His blood alcohol level about an hour after the crash stood at .341, which was four times the legal limit. The court records show his blood alcohol level was still more than three times the limit two hours later. Todd had been busted 15 times in the last two decades, six of these convictions, for driving under the influence. The breakdown showed two under the influence driving in the year 2000, another in 2001, two similar cases in 2003, and one more in 2007 which makes this his seventh time with driving under the influence conviction, accumulating arrests and mugshots. How did he manage to escape all these prior six cases and no judge could tell him it was enough? That's a story for another day. When Todd was handed a life sentence in prison, he got a chance to say a few words. He said, I'm apologizing to the Wimmer family. I am so remorseful and so sorry that I did what I did. I woke up in a hospital room looking at a television and watching the news in the morning to see what I had done. That is how I found out when I did what I did. I do not feel that I am a victim. The victim has passed away because of my ignorance. And I am so truly sorry to the family and everybody else affected by Miss Martinez and I am sorry for how much I am hurting you. I hope you heal fast in every way. I have struggled with alcoholism my whole life. It was never my intent to get up that morning and hurt anyone. Whether I live 30, 40, or 50 years behind walls, I won't let this moment fade as I did my other DUIs. I would let this sting, and I would turn it into everything I can do to honor Angela Wimmer in some sort of way. If he had been as careful as his words, maybe the death of this young woman would have been prevented. Number 3. Tanner Dashner, Kadan Tillett. Alexis Cheney, Anthony Victor, Anthony Martin, and Darian Douglas all died when 21-year-old Tanner Dashner decided to turn his SUV into a ballistic missile. The sixth person involved in the crash survived, including 14-year-old Ari Yania Stanberry, who was ejected out of the crash truck by a bystander. On November 2, 2018, just after Thanksgiving, Tanner was doing some heavy drinking at On the Edge and Grill Tavern, a drinking inn. After drinking to stupor, he got into his car and zoomed off. Meanwhile, the inn was previously connected to another case where a 19-year-old was overserved, allowed to leave without question, and then crashed, killing Claudia Bradley, who just became a mother. Now, back to how the accident happened, Tanner was speeding on a 97 mile per hour in a 30 miles per hour zone in South 25th Street when his sport utility vehicle slammed into the back of a Dodge Dakota at Midway Road. The Dodge, driven by Kadan Tillett and a BMW in front of it, had been stopped at the red light at Midway Road. But Dashner didn't slow down after the signal light had turned red. Instead, he continued to accelerate till the red light turned green. Dashner's GMC eventually hit the Dodge, which then crashed into the BMW. The GMC struck the Dodge a second time, and this time, the Dodge's gas tank was compromised and ignited. Florida Highway Patrol investigators reported that Dashner had a blood alcohol content of 0.274%, more than triple the legal limit. In addition to this, bottles of Bacardi Superior Rum and Crown Royal Regal Apple Whiskey were found in his car. Due to his earlier autism diagnosis, some health professionals claimed that Deschner had no mental capacity to understand that he was intoxicated that night, but Makemson, the victim's lawyer, disagreed. Noting a selfie captioned sloshed was posted on Snapchat by the drunk driver before the crash, an indication that he knew he was drunk. This further restricted Ashley Minton, Dashner's attorney, from asking for reduced sentencing. Assistant State Attorney Brandon White announced Dashner would serve 14 years and five months for each of the five manslaughter charges, with credit for nearly 1,300 days, which totaled 72 years and five months imprisonment. For much of the proceedings, Dashner sat still and remorseful. As the victim's families looked on, fighting back tears, Dashner read an apology letter in St. Lucie County Court. 
He read as, I'm sorry that you will never be able to tell your son I love you and hear him say it back. I'm sorry that you will never get to hug him ever again. I hope that you will be able to heal from this and have a happy and successful life. Number two, Javier Cortez. In the early hours of March 16, 2019, at the intersection of Donovan Road and Miller Street, Santa Maria police arrested a man under the influence who crashed in the area. Javier Cortez was driving his white Chrysler sedan, heading eastbound on Donovan Street, when he ran into a Jeep Cherokee traveling northbound on Miller Street. The intoxicated driver, Javier Artemio Cortez, was just 28 years old when he crashed into the vehicle carrying two people from Atascadero and another passenger. Those from Atascadero were identified as Madison Elizabeth Coleman, who was 17, and Monica Gonzalez, 20. These two were pronounced dead at the scene. The third person, though survived, suffered pelvic damage, a fractured arm and other injuries, and was moved to Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital for surgery. The crash was so tragic that Carol Gantis, a woman who lived at the intersection, said she was woken by an explosive sound. According to the information collected from Cortez Chrysler, California Highway Patrol officers revealed that he was going 104 miles per hour five seconds before the crash and was going on 93 miles per hour a few seconds before the crash. According to Sophia Marquis, a traffic control officer with the Santa Maria Police Department in a preliminary hearing before the judge said, Cortez was at a house party in the 2300 block of Juliston Drive before the incident, where he was reportedly ingesting three to four bottles of beer and tequila jello shot before departing at 2 a.m. During an investigation, David Brewer, a local police officer, said the force of the collision caused a short flash of light which ejected Gonzalez, who was wearing a seatbelt. However, she did not survive the ordeal. As Cortez was on the stand, an emotional Julia Coleman addressed the court, claiming her daughter was a decent girl, who had a job, a boyfriend, and a 14-year-old sibling. Julia continued that Elizabeth was about to start college when this happened. While in Santa Barbara County Superior Court, Cortez pled guilty to drunk driving and homicide, and was charged with serious bodily harm, excessive speeding on a motorway, vehicular manslaughter, and having a blood alcohol concentration of more than 0.15. His confession was unable to give him a sentencing lesser than 21 years in jail. Cortez continued to say it was an accident. For some, that accident took everything from them leaving a lifelong grief. Number 1. Ashley Freeman In a terrible collision, a Santee woman, Lauren Ashley Freeman, took the life of a man while driving drunk on the wrong side of the road. She was sentenced to almost 12 years in prison. On February 26, 2018, Freeman was traveling on a transition ramp between Interstate 8 and 5 when she crashed her blue Toyota Camry with a Volkswagen Jetta shortly before 2 in the morning. Justin Callahan, 35, was inside the Jetta. California Highway Patrol officers revealed that Justin Callahan passed away a few hours after the collision due to the injuries he sustained. According to police reports, Freeman, who was 22 years old, and her passenger suffered severe injuries. Months later, she pled guilty as charged, saying, My lapse of judgment has taken Justin, the guy you all adore, and I will never be able to apologize for my actions that night. While in tears, Freeman said she wished she could do everything to reclaim what had been lost. Investigators said Freeman had a blood alcohol content of 0.28 at the time of the crash. She was sentenced to 11 years and 8 months behind bars. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.